Before we get started, this is what the general outline of today's video is going to be. First, we're going to look at Magnus effect in the context of table tennis. And in the second half, we'll look at how it's one of the key factors that makes top spin such a dominant stroke in modern table tennis. So what is the Magnus effect? It is an effect where a rotating body in a fluid, air in this case, experiences an additional force because of its rotation. In fact, there's a very good video by Veritasium on this topic. I'll leave a link in the description below. In the demonstration in the video, you can see that if there's no spin added to the basketball, it drops down almost straight below. But if you add a little bit of spin, but this time with a bit of backspin, it ends up traveling quite far. So similarly, in table tennis, this effect affects the trajectory of the table tennis ball. And what are the factors that this effect depends on? Ideally, it's difficult to calculate it exactly, but there is a convenient formula that lets us know about the factors involved. To begin with, the effect depends on the spin and the speed of the ball. It also depends on the size and material of the ball, but those are not something that you can change during a match, so we'll not talk about that. And it also depends on the humidity and density of the air, which is why you might have noticed that when playing in different arenas, the trajectory of the ball seems to be a little different. Great, but depending on the spin, what is the direction of this force? In table tennis, for top spin, you have the force acting downwards, which is why a top spin ball usually arcs downwards. In the case of backspin, the force acting on it is upwards, which is why you'd see that in case of a heavy chop or push or defense played, the ball floats up. In case of side spin, you would have the ball just curving towards one side, depending on the spin. If you've been playing table tennis for a while now, then you probably intuitively adjust to these trajectory changes. I mean, you might still block a topspin off the table, but you'll at least be able to contact it. In contrast, if you hit like a spinny topspin ball to a beginner, you would find that they completely misjudge the ball and fail to even contact it sometimes. So yeah, although intuitively you would eventually learn to combat the trajectory change, but knowing about this effect would help you to get there faster. In fact, there's another stroke where the force acts sideways, and you might have seen it in one of Adam Barbro's snake shots. Whoa. If you are relying on, you know, seeing his hand action, it might not work that well for you. Let's see if we could use the Magnus effect to predict which way the ball would turn before it bounces. When he first hits the ball, the angle of launch is headed towards the far side of the table, which is why Cheng Yi Ching moves there. But you soon see that it's approaching the near side of the table, and therefore the force acting on it is towards this side. And Magnus effect would say that for a ball following a trajectory like this, it has to go this way. It can't do this and then go here, which Ching Yi Ching was expecting. So this is one cool way where, you know, Magnus effect can help us predict the spin or the trajectory of the ball. And now let's look at how it also helps to make top spin one of the most dominant strokes in table tennis. I mean, ever since we got rubbers with friction, top spin has existed in some form or another. And in the last few decades or so, we've just got top spin in backhand as well in the service as well, and in fact, a topspin against another topspin as well. But why is that? Turns out, topspin is one of the most reliable ways to get speed. And why do you want speed? Because in modern table tennis, any competitive edge that you might have because of being able to generate more spin or having a unique style will not hold for long because those are things that you can train for. Those are things that people can analyze and figure out. But something that will always have a physical limitation is how fast the human body can react. And therefore, uh, speed is the best bet to win the point, which is why you also see defender styles dying out. Well, with that in mind, why would you use topspin to generate speed? I mean, would you not be better off using a simple flat head to generate as much speed as possible? Why would you want to go through the effort of 
you know, getting grippy rubbers, even sacrificing some speed just so you can add a little bit more topspin. In order to look at that, I've got a simulation here. And what I'm going to be simulating is that given a starting point for the ball and a certain speed for the ball, I'm going to adjust the initial bat angle. And there's going to be an angle at which the ball just manages to cross the net. And then again, there's going to be a second angle where the ball just overshoots the table. If you've got your bat angle anywhere between these two points, then you can land the shot on the table. And in order to make this shot reliably, you would want this margin of error to be large. So I'm going to start off with a point that is a little bit above the net height level. I'm going to use the speed of 40 km per hour, which I think is somewhere around the middle range given that the fastest ball is 120 km per hour. Then I'm using a spin of 3000 RPM, which again is somewhere around the mid range in table tennis. In the simulation, I'd be considering the effects of the Magnus effect and gravity. First, let us look at what the margin of error is for a ball that has no spin. We are going to be looking at a side view of the table, but given the recent WTT highlights, I don't think that should be too much of a problem. For the no spin ball, what we find is that the difference between the angle, you know, for these two curves is 4 degrees. That's okay, I guess, not a very bad margin of error. But what happens if the ball now has a topspin of 3000 RPM? You see now that the difference in the angle changes to 10.5 degrees. That means that the margin for error has more than doubled. You know, This is what makes topspin so reliable. You know, Maybe you're thinking, what happens if I add backspin to the ball? If you add backspin to the ball, then the ball barely just managed to make it through. At least in the first case, the ball was above the net height. If the ball is below the net height, then for certain speeds, you cannot get the ball to land back on the table without adding topspin to it. Okay, that's it for the simulation part. This also explains why it's difficult to play a fast push, because the Magnus effect increases with the speed of the ball and you know you would have the ball flying out of the table. It also explains how if the ball is at a height above the table, then players would prefer to go for a flat hit. And this can be seen quite often in women's table tennis or even, you know, when the ball is really high and you resort to a smash instead of a topspin. And that was it for today's video on Magnus Effect. And to reiterate, you could practice for hours and fine tune your intuition to, you know, not have to worry about this at all and just do it automatically. But knowing all this, I think it gives a good starting point. If you've watched so far, do let me know how you found this video in the comments below. I'm planning to make a few more videos like these covering the fundamentals of table tennis. And if you'd like to watch more stuff like this, do let me know in the comments below and share it with your friends. Thanks for watching.